I'd like to shout out to Don Sinclair and the YouTube channel. Yours truly, Dennis Boval, in a live situation. Hello, my name is Angelique. Welcome to Don Sinclair Reggae Vibes. Today, I am extremely honoured to be sitting here with Dennis Boval. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Um, please tell me all about yourself. Tell us all about yourself from Matumbi to present times, please. <laughs> well, I think we may have to have three <laughs> programs if I decided to do all that. But I'll try and concise it. Right, firstly, how, what age did you get into music? Um, at about the age of 13, I um, applied to join a band at school. And this band was called Roadworks Ahead in 19... Uh, 66 about there and they were look it was a band at school and they were looking for um a guitarist and singer to join the band it was like three young boys and uh, they were looking for a, for a fourth member so i said to them yeah i can play the guitar and i went along jammed with them and then was in the band and from there on it's been it was music all the way okay okay so from that band what was that what was they called that band was called roadworks ahead and, uh, you know, you see the signs in the street, road works ahead, right? So we took our name from that. And, you know, our signs were already made. All we had to do was to borrow them from the local council. So we did that once whilst we were um, doing a concert at school and adorned the stage with these signs, road works ahead, you know, and we're very proud of ourselves. The headmaster came along and said, what have you done, gentlemen? <laughs> Please take them back now. And then that was the end of our, we didn't even have a camera to take photos of it, you know, but that was our attempt at kind of like having some kind of backdrop. Okay, okay. So from Roadworks Ahead. From Roadworks Ahead, um, I then joined the band with some older boys at school. And this band was called Stonehenge. Um, actually, it was made up of two boys, three boys of my age, and two boys older than us. Um, and we decided we were going to be a rock and blues band. Okay. And we played, um, you know, Jimi Hendrix covers, uh, which was uh, quite challenging for me because I was the guitar player. <laughs> and I had to kind of learn all these Jimi Hendrix techniques, which is quite, you know, interesting because at the age of 15, 16, you know, I <clears throat> managed to be able to play the solo of quite a few Jimi Hendrix songs. And um, so, you know, we became known as a kind of rock blues band. And B.B. King was another favorite of mine, trying to, you know, play the guitar like B.B. King. Okay, okay. So um, what was your inspiration? What inspired you? Well, <clears throat> my father was a great music collector. And uh, he had a, a selection of music records, you know, that stretched from ska, blue beat, to um, soul. I mean, some of his favorite artists were like um, Jimmy Smith, um, James Brown, Otis Redding, uh, Wilson Pickett, you know, um, Curtis Mayfield, and people like that. And on one other side, he'd be listening to as well, Fela Kuti, and um, also, you know, B.B. Um, King, and, um, he also listened to Dusty Springfield and the Beatles. And, you know, he had a very wide um, music collection. So just browsing through his collection, I, I could, you know, listen to the Rolling Stones or the Who, you know, he, yeah. Okay, so tell me, how did you form Matumbi? How was Matumbi? How did you well, all get together? I must say, when first time I ever heard Man In Me, mm. it made the hair on my back and my neck stand up. Oh. I love it, I love it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, me too, the first time I heard that song, I thought, I have to make a reggae version of that song. Um, Matumbi was formed when um, Stonehenge kind of fizzled out. Okay. And then we started, I started to have a band now with everyone pretty much my age, you know, uh, except for the drummer, because we needed to be a reggae band. This time, I was venturing into being um, uh, like... Toots and the Maytels. It was Toots was my favourite singer, you know, and um, and I also like the Melodians and groups like that. Um, 
John Holt, Dennis Brown, mm -hmm. um, Ken Booth, um, Pat Kelly, you know, all these people suddenly had, had bubbled to the fore because I'd played everything else and I hadn't played reggae. And um, boys my age at that time were discovering reggae and um, reggae was the, the, the rhythm that afforded us closeness with the other sex, you know, with young <laughs> girls because all the other types of music were quite standoff dancing, right? But reggae, you can actually embrace yes. and you know yeah. get, get to know each other a little better. Yes, and um, so this was particularly interesting for me at um, 17 years old, you know, and uh, thinking, mm, yes, let's 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 do a band that plays only reggae. And people were saying, you know, this is professional suicide because at that time there was Sam and Dave, you know, Otis Redding, and people were wanting to hear soul music as well as reggae, but, but we said, no, we will play only reggae. And um, we started out rehearsing with um, seven people in the band, and it came to a point where we were going to do our first show, live show, and this was in a place called Alcumbry, where um, there were stationed um, US military uh, in an air base. And uh, they, they would have entertainment, weekly entertainment, and uh, one week it was going to be us on our kind of debut gig. And we were told, listen, you lot better not play any reggae. You better play soul music, because these are a bunch of Americans you're playing for here, right? So we started off with an, uh, you know a soul tune, and then the next tune, we played a reggae tune, then we played a soul tune again, then we played reggae from there on in, right? And uh, <laughs> we got them dancing, you know? And uh, this was something that they hadn't, you know, all done. We were showing them dances, to, you know, to go with the music and stuff, and it was, it was quite amusing for them. So they booked us back, you know? And then um, our agent um, had some contact with Pat Kelly and Pat Kelly was looking for a band and we said well we could be your band he came to hear us play and said yeah let's do it so we began we became the backing band for Pat Kelly I mean that was such a great honor to be a reggae band in England and to have the great Pat Kelly say yeah you'll do for me was like endorsement, you know, you can't even imagine. And so we became the backing band of people that came from Jamaica to perform in England, which was quite an honor. It, 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 it signaled that we knew how to deliver reggae in a way that um, people in Jamaica were doing. We had discovered the, um, the recipe, as it were, you know, and then after Pat Kelly came Ken Booth, and then came Johnny Clark, then came um, I Roy. Now this was the first time that a toaster, as the, what we call a toaster, well, I mean it's known as a rapper, someone who speaks on record. This was the first time that a talker was going to appear live with a band. Because up until then, the talkers had come over from Jamaica and had been attached to a sound system, mm -hmm. you know, which would be the, their natural environment, right? And, and talking on the sound system, you know. But this time, um, this talker, or toaster, as we call them, was coming over to do live shows with Matumbi, you know, and it was some of, something of a phenomenon. In fact, I remember one night being double booked in London where this was at the height of it, we had one show in Battersea Town Hall and another show in um, Ealing Town Hall at the same time, on the same night. And the promoters were, you know, getting edgy, like, how can you play two gigs in London on the same night? It's not going to work. Well, history, it worked. And all we had to do was to have two lots of equipment set up at each place. And then well, by the time we finished the first gig, we drove to the next gig, jumped on stage and did it. And, you know, and it was like unheard of that you could do that in London, you know. Um, then the band went on to do recording. Um, we made some records for uh, Trojan Records, which was the reggae label at the time. Um, we 
released um, songs, you know, on, on Trojan's record labels. And uh, then came the time for Lloydie Coxon to um, contact us and say, look, we want to do, I want to do with my sound system, I'm breaking into uh, music production now. And he would had a song that he signed on his sound system with. He was famous for the first record you would hear um, Sir Coxon Sound play at a club like the Roaring Twenties in Carnaby Street in the West End, uh, or anywhere he played, would be this song called Caught You in a Lie. So he then wanted to do a reggae version of that song, and he contacted us and uh, went into the studio, recorded it with Louisa Mark, and the rest is history. Then we also recorded a song called After Tonight, um, One and, of my favourites. Oh, thank you. The, the success of um, Caught You in a Lie meant that we had a vehicle to get our music to the public in this record company that it was called um, Safari. And um, so we allowed Safari to release um, After Tonight on the back of um, the success with Caught You in a Lie because um, it was just... In fact, both tunes had the same instrumentation by the same players. Um, and if I can hold my hand up, I was the bass player <laughs> and the guitar player and the keyboard player, you know, um, and it was a success, that song, after tonight. So then we, we continued, but you know, as always in the music business, troubles always brewing with record companies. There's always, um, discontent you know from the top to the bottom and so discontent set in and then we decided to do our own label now driving to a gig in East Grinstead one day on the radio came uh, an a cappella version of The Man in Me by a group called um, The Persuasions from an album called Street Corner Symphony and they had performed this song, The Man in Me, a cappella on there, and we heard it on the radio. And I went to the local record store and ordered that record. And we had, you know, it was like by, by mail, and we had to wait till the record came. And then when it came and we played the whole album, um, that version of The Man in Me was so striking, right, that I felt, you know, we should do a reggae version of that. You know, and it was a very little heard of song. In fact, at the time, we had no idea that the original song was written by Bob Dylan. Okay. And um, so when we found out that um, it was a Bob Dylan song, it was fitting because Jimi Hendrix had also done a Bob Dylan song um, all along the Watchtower. So I figured, you know, um, and the Rolling Stones had done, a, you know, everyone had done a Bob Dylan song. So it, only, it was only fitting for um, the... Britain's premier reggae band to do a Bob Dylan song and that was it so um, we did that and we released it on our own label you know and, and it was well received Okay, so did you find it hard to break out in the UK as a, as a reggae band? In the beginning not at all because um, we then signed to EMI Records and went on several tours of Britain um, the first tour, we, we supported um, a man called Ian Drury and his Blockheads. And um, he was very popular at the time, and he was doing a tour called Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll. And we were on that tour opening um, the show uh, alongside another band called Worldwind. So uh, some nights Worldwind would go on first and we would go on second. And some nights we'd go on first and Whirlwind would go on second and then Ian Drury and the Blockheads would come on. But at the end of the show, Ian would invite us, me in particular, to come on and jam while they were doing the, end, the final encore of the night, which was sex and drugs and rock and roll. Da, 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 right? And, um, you know, after that, we, we toured around as well with Peter Tosh. When Peter Tosh came to the UK to do his um, tour with uh, Mick Jagger. They had um, a duet together, a song called Walk and Don't Look Back, uh, Mick Jagger and Peter Tosh. 
and we were invited to be the opening band on that tour and it went right around Europe so um, we then branched out from playing in nearly every uh, place in the UK to starting to do you know Holland, France, Belgium, Germany and build up our reputation. Okay let's move on to your producing. I know that you wrote and produced Silly Games Correct. which was and still is incredibly big. Everybody knows Silly Games. Yeah. Tell me more about your pro producing. Well, um, <clears throat> at a time when um, the band wouldn't let me produce them no more, <laughs> <laughs> I had to turn my production skills to other uh, musical um, ventures. And uh, Chris Blackwell had contacted me and said, would I produce um, a group of young girls um, called The Slits, um, who were a punk band, and also, I had produced Steel Pulse and um, Marie Pierre. And uh, then I'd written this song that um, was more like a kind of reggae song that uh, I might imagine Minnie Ripperton singing. And um, once, whilst working with um, Janet Kay on the production for D Roy Records, I, um, I thought, She's the singer. So I, you know, spoke to her and said, Janet, will you sing this tune? And uh, I remember kind of sitting on the piano, playing it to her, right? And then when it came to the bit that went, <laughs> when I scaled that, she was like, what? I must be able to do that if you can. <laughs> you know, and the rest is history. Um, we went into the recording studio and I got Drummy Zeb, the drummer from Aswad, to play this drum pattern that I had running around in my head all the time, you know, where the hi-hat was leading the proceedings, right? It was a pattern that, until then, no one had played that pattern on a reggae tune. And um, I invented that pattern and then looked for a drummer that could play it. Now, Drummy Zeb is positively the most vibrant British of British young drummers, you know, of our age, you know. So I invited him to try out this pattern where it was like... And I thought, yeah, now we're going to take away the, um, the style of drumming from my old friend Sly Dunbar. Sly Dunbar was running things when it comes to playing drums. Uh, any kind of obscure drum pattern that you could think of that was fitting into reggae was usually um, invented and executed by Sly Dunbar. So this was my attempt at knocking him off the number one drumming spot with this pattern. Gave it to Drummy Zeb. He said, yeah, let's do it. Then him and myself, we went into the studio He's playing the drums, I'm in the control room playing the bass, and I'm the sound engineer. And he doesn't really know the tune. I'm singing the tune and, and you know, saying, well, this is how it goes, you know. I've been wanting you for so long, it's a shame. And then when it came to the bit that goes, to play your silly game, right? He suddenly went, ba ba do ba 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 I don't want that there, right? <laughs> but then we got to the end of the take, and I said, I said, oh, man, let's listen back to it. And when I listened back to it, what he'd done is that he'd, he'd given the song a peak and put a roll in, right, that, that took it over the over the humpback bridge, you know, and, and gliding it all the way down to... And I thought, you know what? I didn't want that, but it's great, right? And then um, I filled in the guitar parts, the keyboard parts you know, all the instrumentation. In fact, that song was made by three of us. There's Drummy Zeb on the drums, there's me on the rest of the instruments, and um, there's Miss Gay on the vocals. Singing very nicely. Yeah. Um, name your top three genres of music. Well, I'm very partial to soul. Very partial. I am, <laughs> and um, jazz. You like your jazz. And classical. Okay. Okay. Um, if you hadn't have been a musician, what do you think 
would have been your calling in life? I'd have liked to have been a painter. As an artist, painter, uh, or painter. Yeah. And... Uh, no, not not a painter and decorator. <laughs> <laughs> an artist, a painter. Um, but I started out my um, uh, life, working life, as a, a contact lens technician. Oh. I was in in the beginning of the invention of the contact lens. There were lots of laboratories around making contact lenses to prescription. Contact lenses were not yet um, available on the peg, as it were, you know. And um, I was, because uh, one of the only people that didn't wear glasses in my family, I was very interested in um, ophthalmic research. And I thought I might have been uh, an optician, perhaps, because uh, in my family there was musicians, there were doctors, there were lawyers, there were mathematicians and scientists, and I figured that um, an ophthalmic surgeon would put me, you know, <laughs> in good stead yeah. with them. <laughs> but um, music stole my heart. It can do that. Yeah. Right, so all the songs that you've written and produced, what would you say is your favourite? Well, um, by now, uh, my favourite has been chosen for me by the people, which is Silly Games. Um, but my um, favourite that perhaps a lot of people don't know is a song called Choose Me. Now, this song um, I wrote in about 20 minutes for a bet. I was in the recording studio and um, my friend John Kapai was uh, involved in making um, uh, a cover version of um, a song called Peaceful Woman that um, Marcia Griffiths had sung. And uh, they were reconstructing that rhythm in the studio. And, and I came in, I probably had a few drinks and said, oh, what are you doing? Making another version of a version. Why don't you write a song? <laughs> right? And then... Uh, uh, the 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 man who owned the studio, um, Dennis Harris, said, "You know, I was a run up on a mode like you know, he's any songwriter." And I'm going, "Mate, I am a songwriter, okay, and I'll write you a song right now." And he was going, "Yeah." So I was like, it, the, the the argument escalated, and it came to, "All right, put your money where your mouth is. Put a hundred pounds on the table, and I'll write that song and take the money." And he took the hundred pounds, he put it on the table, he went, write the song. So I'm like, hmm, hmm, okay, good, good, good. And I'd had a friend called Rudolph who'd passed away, a friend from Nigeria called Rudolph. And um, he was one of the friends around my sound system. And um, he was always saying to me before he passed away, he's going, Dennis, listen to this. This is a great way to start a song. And he go, baby. It's a sad situation, I know, when more than one man wants you so. And it's even worse when you got to choose and all but one of us is going to have to lose. <laughs> right? And that was it. And I was like, Rooks. And the rest of the song is going, that's it. you got to finish the song. And when he passed away, this, it, it, was, I, it was, you know, in the back of my mind. So when I was, you know, forced to write a song, I started it off with that and went, and, and it was as though he'd come back to visit me and he was with me all the way and, and the rest of the song went, so baby, won't you listen to my voice and make the right choice? Choose me, choose me, yeah. You know, and then on from there. For me, you are the sun, the moon and the stars, my Venus, my Mars, my everything. You know, like that. It was, it was what we call... um sentimental lyrics right and rooks was a sweet boy he <laughs> was a real sweet boy you know? i'm telling you right in fact um he was so jamaican right in his dress and his attitude that no one would even um have suspected that he was nigerian and it was great you know and he was quite a flamboyant character so i wrote the song took the money we went to a bar and then Marie Pierre heard the song and said, I want to sing that. Made a version with her. And then off the back of that, Paulette Taja heard it and made her version as well. So, um, you know, that's... Uh... 
Okay. So of all the people that you've worked for, is there a particular artist that you would like to work with? Well, I like to work with them all um, that I worked with before. And uh, I just finished working with Joss Stone. Joss Stone contacted us to say she wanted to do a bit of writing with me and, um, you know, some recording. And so when I heard the texture of that young lady's voice, it was like, what? A voice like that? From England, Devon, you know, and um, we, we did an, an album together, and it's and um, there's some tunes with Damien Marley on there, and, and Linton Quessy Johnson, and um, the album's called um, Water for Your Soul, and then I did some dub things on there, and that was like magic, you know. We've just finished that, but I guess if there's an artist that I haven't worked with yet, um, that I would quite like to do something with, I guess I'd have to say Stevie Wonder. Okay, okay. Why Stevie? Because I've long since been a Stevie Wonder baby, a Stevie Wonder fan. For me, Stevie Wonder can do nothing wrong, you know, and um, I'd love to get him on a tune that we probably wrote together or, or I'd like to to do a real reggae tune for Stevie Wonder. Okay, okay. So, you've been around for a long time now. What is the highlight of your musical career? Well, um, perhaps um, working with the poet Linton Quessy Johnson. Now, ever since the time um, we met, we have been inseparable. We've been in the recording studio on all his recordings. Uh, and I've been on the stage in all his live recordings and, and performing all over the world uh, with Linton in places like um, South Africa, for instance, in places like um, Turkey, um, New Zealand, Australia, Iceland, um, pretty much all over the globe, Brazil, you know, um, Martinique and Guadeloupe. You know, not to mention France and Germany and Italy and Spain and Holland and Belgium, you know. So I, I, I have to say the highlight of my career has been... Mr. Bovel, let's go back to the sound system that you was talking about before. Can you tell us what it's called? My sound system was called Sufferers Hi-Fi. And um, we were the resident sound at um, the Metro in Ladbroke Grove. We were all the resident sound at um, the Whiskey A Go Go in the West End and um, another club in Stockwell. Now, this, this club in Stockwell was called The Lansdowne and um, we played there on Sundays and we played in the, the Metro on Fridays. In fact, whilst we were resident sound there, um, Bob Marley was across the road in Basing Street recording the Exodus album. So uh, sometimes on a Friday night, he would come in to where we were playing and um, Family Man would give us um, dub cuts of what was being recorded across the road. So we were able to preview cuts from the Exodus album and our sound system became huge. I mean, every Friday night we would bring um, sound systems like Fat Man, um, Admiral Ken, TWJ, Sir Jessus, um, who else? Uh, Shaka. In fact, uh, on New Year's Eve 1975 was where Shaka and I had the big showdown, you know, in the Metro, and it was all about the dub then. Um, also, you know, this club, the youth club, the Metro Youth Club, would um, put on uh, shows by... Dennis Brown, it was actually in that club whilst playing my sound system that I met Louisa Mark, who came to sing on the version side of Silhouettes, that Dennis Brown tune, and Dennis Brown was in the dance. And when he heard her, he came right up and said to me, Boss, DB, listen, never never sing with that girl then. <laughs> right, and um, also it was in that same club that I met um, Young Drummy Zeb, as a drummer, he was the drummer before he played in Aswad. He was the drummer of the Metronome Steel Band, and that was their kind of um, pan yard, 
right? And um, they were rehearsing in there, and he was the drummer. And uh, I remembered um, his surprise that, that I knew anything about drums, and then, you know, then they realized that I was also a member of Matumbi, and I was also a member of Sufferers I Fi. And, um, you know, so I was like kind of bordering both sides because at that time, a sound system was the most important thing than a group. Yeah. A sound, sound systems were more popular than groups. How Matumbi got um, to be a popular group as well was that we were, because of me, attached to Sufferers Sound. Right, so I had um, the the records that that we could then go away and rehearse and try and play like the sound system. I mean, and sometimes when the group played, we'd have like a mixing desk, and then put two wires uh, stereo into the sound system so that the group came all over the room. And that, that was the early PA system. It was a wonderful time to be making music. Absolutely. It really, really was. Absolutely. I have to mention too that um, among all uh, the other people that, that Matumbi backed was a, a singer called Nicky Thomas. Uh, Nicky Thomas was uh, the man that did that song, Have a Little Faith. And uh, together we were the first group to perform at the club that then became Columbo's that used to be the Roaring Twenties. How long did your sound system run for? Well, I became a member with this sound system. It started in 1969. And um, it ran from 69 until 74 for me. Um, because in 74, we were the sound at a club called the Carib Club in Cricklewood. And the club was invaded by police officers. And um, a fight ensued, and I was accused of having started that fight, and uh, quite wrongfully found guilty um, of causing an affray, and um, appealed, but only after spending uh, nine months on trial at the Old Bailey, then um, six months of a three-year sentence in jail um, to be exonerated at the appeal level um, and um, given uh, release from jail and the quash of my sentence because police officers had perjured themselves in court and blatantly lied that they had seen me do something that I hadn't done. You understand, and um, so that was time for me to jack the sound system business in and concentrate more on the group. Then, when I was released from prison, I thought, "Hey, forget about that." And uh, I'd written several songs whilst I was in there, and uh, we, you know, turned them songs into um, an album that came out later on. Okay, um, tell me about Dexys Midnight Runners and other people that you produced. <laughs> Dexys, okay, well. Um, there's a guy, a friend of mine, called Mickey Foote. Now, Mickey Foote used to uh, produce uh, and manage a group called The Clash. In fact, just recently, whilst on an air airline watching the news, I saw him in conflict with Donald Trump about selling his piece of land that he bought in some Scottish um, sand dunes. And Donald Trump had bought all the land around there, but Mickey wasn't selling his piece of land to Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah, and so um, Mickey had uh, come to me and said, uh, I've, got, I've got this group, I want you to, to mix um, uh, their first single. And um, that f group turned out to be Dexy's Midnight Runner, and they had written a song about, uh, it was called What About? And uh, it was, the, 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 the gist of the song was, everybody says Irish people are stupid, but what about, and then, then, then called the name of a really prominent Irishman, what about, and what about him, and what, I mean, a, a long list of prominent Irishmen in society, you know, that had actually contributed to, to a whole host of things, and, it, you know, that was their first song, Dexy's Midnight Runner. Thank you very much you. for coming to meet with me once again. My privilege. This is Angelique for Don Sinclair Reggae Vibes. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.